Hey guys, before we get started with today's video, I'd like to announce my Patreon. Now, this has been a long time coming. I found that I can't really make the videos that I really want to make on YouTube thanks to the algorithm. And this is a way that I think I can make the videos that I really want to make. On my Patreon, you will be able to find audio versions of my videos, early access to my videos before they hit YouTube, and the ability to vote on what videos I make next and many more benefits. So if you like the videos that I make and you'd like some perks from the channel, then head on over to my Patreon with the link in the description or on the screen to gain access to the exclusive content on there. I already have next week's video up on Patreon and a bunch of audio files from past videos on my Patreon. Thanks for watching and see you there. This is the story of West Atlantic Flight 3319. On the 4th of June, 2019, a cargo Boeing 737 was on its way from Oslo to Brussels. On this flight, the captain was in the right-hand seat, and he was watching over the first officer, who was completing his command upgrade line training. The first officer would have his hands full today as there was a thunderstorm around Brussels airport. As the jet approached Brussels, the pilot could hear ATC rerouting planes around the active weather system. Their weather radar showed them what was causing all of this commotion, a pretty bad storm near the airport. But the southeast of the airport was clear so the pilots decided to make an approach from the southeast. The pilots went about prepping the plane for an ILS approach onto runway 25 right. The ILS, or the instrument landing system, is a godsend as far as pilots are concerned. It allows the plane to follow radio beacons on the ground right down to the runway. It allows pilots to land in bad weather even when the runway is invisible. In the cockpit, the pilots were preparing the plane for the landing and they were talking about threats and issues that they might face on this landing. But unknown to them, no amount of preparation would be able to help them deal with what came next. At 6.46 p.m., the pilots heard a loud electrical clunk, and immediately, the EFIS display on the left-hand side went dark. Whatever had happened also took out the autopilot and the auto throttle. The EFIS, or the Electronic Flight Instrument System, had two screens the electronic attitude indicator, and the electronic horizontal situation indicator. You don't need me to tell you that those are important indicators in the cockpit, and these pilots had just lost some of their instruments for some weird reason. The captain, who was monitoring the progress of the first officer, immediately took control and manually started flying the plane. But there was a problem. ATC could no longer find the 737 on their radar scopes. The transponder had failed. At this point, the captain did not know if something else, something much more crucial might fail. So he declared a pan, pan, pan and asked priority for runway 25 right. As the plane made its way to Brussels, the pilots took stock of what was working and what wasn't. To their dismay, they found out that both control displays of the flight management computers were not working. In addition to that, they had a barrage of warnings telling them that all sorts of things were wrong with their plane, from the number one aft fuel pump to the pressurization system to the yaw damper. Something was seriously broken with this plane. Since they had the EFIS displays on one side, they decided to fly a manual ILS approach. As the approach continued, the captain told ATC that they had a severe electrical issue and that they were upgrading their pan 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 to a mayday. They wanted to get this jet on the ground as fast as possible. As the plane approached Brussels, they were a bit too high, but they were able to intercept the glide slope from above and they continued with the landing. As they flew the approach, the captain noticed that the EGPWS, or the Enhanced Ground Proximity Warning System, was not working. If they got too close to the ground, the plane would not let them know. Great, another thing that wasn't working. But what truly worried him was the weather cell near the airport. It was described as a wall of water with lightning piercing the clouds every 20 seconds or so. This landing would be hard without a massive storm cell nearby. But that was the situation that these pilots found themselves in. When they were just one mile from the safety of the runway, rain engulfed the airplane and the pilots had to go around. The captain had no idea how much thrust he needed to use to carry out the climb out. So, he just estimated it, and thank God, it worked. The plane started to climb, and the captain put the plane into a left-hand bank. 
As he did that, the first officer set the transponder to ATC-2, and it worked. Now, ATC could see the pilots on the radar again. As the pilots orbited Brussels, they noticed that the transfer bus number one circuit breaker was open. The pilots debated on whether or not they wanted to reset the circuit breaker. The thing is, the plane was flyable, and they had no idea what resetting the circuit breaker might do. So they decided to leave it open and land the plane with what they had. If it is broke, don't fix it if it might make things worse. The pilots told air traffic control that they had lost a lot of systems and they were down to their basic navigational skills to fly the plane. They thought of diverting to another airport, but they had no idea what might or might not fail in the time that it took for them to get there. They now had to make this landing count. The plane was losing systems as time went on, and they had no idea what they would lose if they had to go around a second time. I have no idea what the pilots felt during the last few moments of their flight. I imagine that they were just hoping that the plane would hold together just long enough until they could land. The plane touched down at 7.22 p.m. local time. The moment they touched down, they lost their VHF radios and engine indications for both engines. They had made it in the nick of time. Imagine if they had lost some important information like that in the air. That would have made this bad situation worse. Once the plane was on the ground, the investigators started going over the plane to understand what had happened. They noticed the open circuit breaker the pilots had noticed as well. It was the transfer bus number one breaker. The 737 gets its power from generators. Each engine has one generator fitted to it and one to the APU or the auxiliary power unit. Any one of the generators can power all essential systems of the plane through a series of interconnects and buses. Buses, for those of you who don't know, is an electrical engineering term that refers to a node where multiple loads or systems are connected. Think of it like a hub. Man, that one electrical engineering class during my undergrad really paid off, eh? Back to what I was saying. From the generator, the power is transferred to a generation bus, and then it's sent to a distribution bus. Looking at the electrical layout of the 737 and the failures that the plane experienced, they realized that all systems that had failed received their power from the 115-volt AC Elex bus 1. They also got their data from the air data computer, which was in turn connected to the aforementioned bus. This meant that a failure in this one bus would take out a massive chunk of the pilot's systems. So to test their theory, they hooked the plane up to ground power and then tested the system to see what was working and what wasn't. As expected, the 115-volt bus did not power on, but the bus itself was fine. They traced how power was flowing. The generator bus was getting power, but the transfer bus that was directly connected to it was not getting power. This was because the relay between the generator bus and the transfer bus had failed thus causing the incident. But here's the thing though, when the transfer bus fails, you usually expect a warning message, transfer bus off, to light up. But due to the power loss, that did not happen. So the pilots did not even know that their transfer bus had failed. Had they known that, they could have easily rerouted power from another generator to the systems in order to get their offline systems back online. So how did the crew do in this case? The crews had not been trained for such an electrical failure in the simulator, and without a deep understanding of the electrical system of the 737, it would have been hard for the pilots to understand what was happening. They basically had to work off the systems that had failed and the quick resource handbook to get the plane down safely. The captain put a lot of pressure on himself by flying the plane in very busy airspace without a functioning transponder, but that was the only option that he had at the time and his decision to land at Brussels in visual conditions was the right call to make. How they would have gotten to another airport without their basic navigational aids, I don't know. But in their hurry to land at the airport, the pilots created a high-pressure environment in the cockpit that they made some small mistakes like misconfiguring the airplane for landing. But I still think they did an amazing job considering they landed the plane with just basic instruments. But... Why did the relay fail in the first place, though? The investigators took the relay and looked at its history. It was manufactured in 1985, but they found no issues in the history of the part, 
and it even had no problems after it had been fitted to the accident plane in 2018. So it just failed, I guess. But we have one final question. Why do the pilots lose even more instruments the moment they touch down? Well, that was traced to the 28 volt DC standby bus. When the plane touched down, the air ground switch turned off the standby power off relay, which in turn powered the 28 volt DC standby bus, which in turn powered the instruments that they lost on touchdown. This is one accident that could have been a lot more worse. Had they lost more instruments or had the weather been worse than it already was, this could have ended in disaster. In your opinion, how good of a job did the pilots do on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is the worst and 10 is the best? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. The interesting thing is that this very same plane had another emergency just like this over England. If you want me to make a video about that, then leave a like and comment below so that me and the algorithm knows that you want more of these kind of videos. It really does make a difference. If you want to watch another mini air crash investigation video, then may I suggest American Airlines Flight 132. They were in such a bad state that their floor was melting. You can find the link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.